I'll let them get se seated. And if you could, uh, if you could come to the microphone, it would help in recording uh, when you when you want to pose a question. Um, so what I'd like to do at this point is just simply open the floor to the board members, uh, and um, please feel free to just go ahead, raise your hand, and come to the microphone. Not all at Ooh, once. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Mike Parsons, uh, newest member on the board, so I guess I get to go first. <laughs> I didn't realize that when I got on. The board. Um, I found tonight's discussion incredibly interesting. Um, I thought you both did a very professional job. And, and my background is, is in engineering and it's in environments like this and I've been in um, all different kinds and this had to be the most professional and I attribute that to the quality of you two and your backgrounds but also the way the audience responded to that. And I, I just think that was terrific. Um, and through the question and answer period, a lot of my questions were answered, so um, not in any particular order. I did jot down a few questions as we went through. So first, um, again, a, a little bit on the model, and this goes to you, Dr. Shanahan. Um, at one point, you talked about um, some limitations that you had to uh, make some assumptions about in creating the model, such as uh, the amount of recharge, you pick half of the annual precipitation, for example, and you, you um, assume some leakage through some of the confining layers, and uh, you made some assumptions on s soil data, and, I, and I'm sure, Dr. Newton, you had to do the same thing. Any, any reaction or feel for how those assumptions um, influenced the model results, and if you varied them, would the results have been significantly different? We, we actually did uh, vary them as far as the original part of the work to look at the, uh, the flow. And so we, we looked at the effect of varying some of those assumptions on the prediction of, this, of the capture zone, for example. And, and that's a pretty standard sort of thing. You do some sensitivity analysis. Um, you, know, the, the, uh, you know, there's assumptions and there's assumptions. I mean, we didn't just assume a number, obviously. We, we, we based our result on literature data, um, you know, various information. I mean, we had, for example, we, we, we know about the properties of clay. We knew the thickness of the clay. So we were able to make a fairly um, reasoned assumption as to the number. Now, it, it, it's uncertain. You know, there's uncertainty around that number. But nonetheless, you know, we didn't just pick something out of the air. The recharge number actually is fairly robust because the USGS has done studies of low flow, low summertime flow, and that turns out to be a pretty good indicator of what the rate of recharge is. So we, I felt we had a pretty good number for the recharge. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned another. Let, let me just add the, uh, something on, on the recharge. I, I think the recharge number is a good number. Um, one of the things that we have done uh, is some studies on hydrologic budgets in local watersheds. Uh, including the Mill River in Northampton and the Avery Brook up in the Northampton Reservoir area. And, you know, that, the number is a reasonable number based on those studies. We look at hydrologic budgets. We look at what, from a mass balance standpoint, what that uh, recharge is likely to be. I think it's a good number. Okay, I think the third parameter was leakage through confining layers. Yes. Yeah, and that was based on the difference in hydraulic head above and below the clay layer, I believe. It's been, it, uh, uh, and it's been a long time. <laughs> I mean, the, the, this work was done, uh, you know, six or seven years ago. But I think we looked at the thickness of the clay, the properties of a typical clay, I think. And was all, okay, it came out of calibration as well. So we looked at the model results, realized that we were off in that area and that we needed to make adjustments. So I guess it was more by calibration, but I think we, I think we checked it against, you know, we checked it for reasonableness given the properties of the materials. So, and so with, with all of that said, um, if there was some variation in those parameters, what would be your expectation on the impact on model results? Well, we, as I said, we did do yeah. some variations. It didn't have a big okay. impact. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, Dr. Newton, another perhaps a small point, but I, I wasn't quite sure of the significance. You mentioned that a portion of the aquifer in East Hampton is a sole source aquifer. And um, I wondered, does that relate to the, the flow path 
that that uh, that's been mapped out from the Northampton landfill to the Maloney well, or is that far enough south so that it's not an issue? Or what's the relationship there? The, the sole source aquifer de designation uh, is for the uh, wells as far north as the Nonatuck Park well, which is does not include the area of the landfill. Um, the sole source aquifer designation was determined at a time when the uh, zone two of the Maloney well was not known, so it was not included in that designation. Um, I don't know what would have happened if it had been known and what, what we, where we would be today, but um, at that time, the, the uh, uh, source of the Maloney well was unknown, so it was not included in that designation. And, and my understanding of the significance of sole source, once you, that designation is made, then there are further limitations on land uses above, above the aquifer? Is that, is that um, the right way to look at it? I, I don't, uh, there are some uh, restrictions, but I don't think it's as, as great as that. I don't think it's too much more than what a standard zone two is, uh, actually. Um, I, I think that the biggest issue that, that I'm wrestling with at the moment is um, how, how should the city, how should our board view um, the presence of these two unlined landfills, the two big ones, uh, East Hampton has one, we have one, um, in this, in the same general proximity and in, in relationship to what we're what the city's proposing to add to the landfill system out there. And is, you know, questions that come to mind are, uh, is, are the current online sources so large that they are, will mask the impacts of the expansion? Or conversely, do we expect the impacts of the online landfills to diminish fairly soon and, and that that we're really extending the life of potential impacts. I, I'm not saying it real well, but I'm trying to come up with how to assess the, 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 the magnitude of the problem we're facing with our expansion versus the one we already have in front of us. And if you have any thoughts on I, I would just, look at that. I, I will just say that um, we are working on really developing a new model because we don't believe that any of the components of ModFlow are able to adequately model dissolved oxygen. So we are developing a new model uh, uh, with some colleagues to try to, to look at that. And, and, and what we're, um, at least what the preliminary stuff looks like is that it does look like that there is a significant component <laughs> that's, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, consumption of dissolved oxygen is coming out of the uh, uh, the East Hampton landfill, uh, the old Oliver Street landfill. Mm -hmm. um, and that does merge with the unlined portion, the effects of the unlined portion of the Northampton landfill. Uh, what the impact of the uh, additional material is, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we, we are not in a position to really quantify any of that at this mm -hmm. point, but we do have some, some directions we're moving with that. Okay. Uh, and I, where we are is that we have um, already applied a model, um, and I agree that ModFlow is not the tool. ModFlow does not do chemical transport. There are We actually use three different models. One is known as RT3D, which is reactive transport in three dimensions, and we use that to model BOD and DO, and what we find, we only did it for, you know, the, the landfill, the uh, North Hand landfill. And we saw very minimal effect. It was, it's basically localized uh, around the landfill and doesn't extend to the, uh, kind of to the east, you know, of any appreciable distance as far as the, the, the larger aquifer. Um, we also use another model called um, oh, MT3D MS, I think it was. So um, mass transport in three dimensions with multiple species, which is a, uh, which is the, the, basically there are a number of uh, you know subsidiary models that work with ModFlow to do contam uh, contaminant transport. There's three or maybe I know of at least three ver versions of you know flavors of those models that you can do the chemical transport with. We needed to use a different one for 
the four constituents other than BOD and dissolved oxygen, and then we used RT3D for BOD and dissolved oxygen and, and did not see, you know, a particular um, dissolved oxygen BOD problem. And did, did your work, um, did your work provide a prediction of the contaminants that might migrate from the, the proposed landfill as compared to the existing facilities? We did not differentiate those. We counted for both in a generalized source. And the source is, you know, six of those little grid cells on the model. It's right. a row of three and a row of three under it. So it's relatively, you know, coarse in its representation, if you like. But And, um, and, and we just used mass coming from all five phases as, as part of that source. We didn't differentiate it. Would it would a first cut at that be reasonable to look at the, um, the volume projections from each of the types of uh, landfills that have been built to date and the proposed ones and then at least ratio it? Well, we, yeah, and we do have the numbers in our report for the different uh, leakage rates. We separate those out. So you could, you could look at those differences, yes. Great. That's all I have. Thank you both. I, I guess with respect to that, though, one thing to bear in mind is that the representation of phase five is extremely conservative because we assume a single liner was consumed and, uh, assumed instead of the double liner. So that one is, is, is biased high. My question goes right to that point, which is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, first, I want to second what Mike said about um, the professionalism that you brought to this discussion. It was great, both of you. Um, but you mentioned, and this is for Dr. Shanahan, you mentioned in so many ways this was a very conservative study, and the assumptions you made were very conservative. Could, how could you have gotten more conservative, and what do you anticipate those results might have different? There was an example in the report, Peter, about the, uh, the methylene chloride concentration, what the release concentration would have to be to have an impact on the well. So you could use that as a comparison to what the concentrations were that we actually found in leachate. I'm not sure I have the most up-to-date version with that figure in it. Um, got it on my laptop. Um, gee, you know, you know I mean, I, I, as far as how conservative you go, you know, I mean, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, it's, um, but obviously becomes unreasonable at some point. I mean, I thought we were consistently conservative in the assumptions we made, so we compounded conservative assumptions, you know, I mean, you know, if we assumed 500, well, you could have assumed 1,000, but, you know, 500 bounded the numbers that we, um, that we saw. So, I, I, you know, I think you can look at the report, and if you read it carefully, you can get a sense for the degree to which we were conservative and the fact that we tended to um, compound those conservative assumptions. Um, I mean, I guess you could always get more and more conservative, but at some point it becomes really pretty unreasonable. I thought we did a pretty balanced job of being conservative, and that, that seemed to be the opinion that, you know, DEP reached as well. And then um, this is a question for you, Dr. Newton. When you looked at well 238, how many other measures did you take of water in the same location? Uh, there's only one other that I know of. Only one other? Analysis of that well that I'm, that I'm familiar with. Are there other wells in that area? No. So that's the only well in that, yes. that area? Yes. Um, and could there have, what would be, you say, this represents leachate from the landfill. And what's that based on? <coughs> Chemistry. High zinc, high lead, high chrome. Oh, sorry. Okay. And that represented two, an N of two in, in your analysis of, of uh, well 238? Right. Okay. And. Um, Clearly, we need to take more samples. I am an advocate of many more samples. I am an advocate of many more wells, actually. There was another well um, to the east of that well, and I don't 
have the number. MWB? Yeah, no, below that, south of that. Yeah. I forget the number. 930 or yeah. something? 932? Did, were any tests done on that? Yes. And what were the results of that? Uh, that one has uh, arsenic um, uh, about at the MCL. It has, a, it has a chemistry. If you want to talk about the geochemistry of the well, we can talk about that. Um, that these wells have geochemistry that have a leachate signature. They are sodium bicarbonate wells, sodium carbonate carb bicarbonate wells. Um, and I think that the carbonate bicarbonate high alkalinity that we're seeing in these systems is because of the uh, degradation of the uh, uh, organic compounds coming out of the leach leachate. So that they have a leachate signature of an oxidized leachate plume. Uh, that's coming in. These wells also have low dissolved oxygen, uh, three or four milligrams per liter, something like that. Um, so I think that, that you're looking at a downstream oxidized leachate plume, high chloride, uh, high sodium. In it's nothing like we're, we've just completed a survey of 90 groundwater wells in the local area, and these, these wells are totally anomalous in terms of their major element chemistry. Could you explain that for, for um, when when you see high, high um, uh, alkalinity, which is the bicarbonate, and in these cases even carbonate because the pH is so high, um, you see the counter ion of calcium being the dominant counter ion, and you assume that it's coming from calcium carbonate because there is calcium carbonate in the local rocks, um, and that's where the alkalinity is coming from. The wells around the landfill have a very different signature. They have a, a sodium bi bicarbonate carbonate system. They don't have high calcium concentration. So it's not coming from calcite. It's coming from the, the organics that are coming out of the landfill. Those organics are being oxidized to uh, carbonate or bicarbonate. And can you explain how this would be harmful? It's not harmful directly. It's just a, it's just a uh, a measure of leachate moving out of the system and you're downstream of that leachate. And with low dissolved oxygen, the, the problem is that you are mobilizing uh, arsenic that is not coming from the landfill but is resident in the aquifer skeleton that is being released by the low dissolved oxygen. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Terry is uh, approaching the, the podium. I happen to notice that our two speakers are both drinking bottled water. Um, <laughs> I, I don't exactly know what that means. I hope it has got Northampton tap water inside. <laughs> yeah, we just filled it. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Terry Colhane. Um, I'd just like to follow up on the low dissolved oxygen. Dr. Newton, uh, Dr. Shanahan suggested that that's fairly a fairly local problem. And I think you've both discussed the fact that it tends to create, uh, it tends to, a, a low oxygen environment tends to dissolve minerals or, or metals that might not otherwise dissolve. Would you agree that that's pretty much a local problem? Uh, you, I don't. You talked about creating a BOD or model. But is that something? Oh, dissolved that oxygen model. Uh, yes, okay. I don't think any of the models that are associated with, with ModFlow adequately model dissolved oxygen. They only do it through decay of some other comp compound. They don't do dissolved. You can't so it's run indirect. that model without, dissolved o without having some compound to use up the dissolved oxygen. And so what we're trying to do is to, is to run the model without any contaminants to see what the normal dissolved oxygen level would be and to predict what dissolved oxygen would be at the Maloney well. We know dissolved oxygen is naturally low at the Maloney well, presumably because its travel path of the groundwater in the distance it has to go under the clay is so long that uh, the amount of organics that are naturally present in the aquifer and the chemical reactions, the oxidation reactions that are going on are naturally reducing dissolved oxygen to a fairly low value. Now what we want to do is to add to that the, the effect of this oxidation of organic material right in the landfill and to see how that uh, impacts it. And since the landfill is located right next to the boundary with the clay, that if you just get a little bit of 
degradation of dissolved oxygen to go underneath the clay, then you have an impact downstream because you don't have any other dissolved oxygen coming in. Our results suggest that this is an important process to consider. Um, and uh, I don't think that, I mean, we see low dissolved oxygen in a lot of wells. The problem, of course, with dissolved oxygen is that it can be low because of natural processes. And so teasing out that which is due to landfill leachate oxidation versus natural oxidation, you know, from swamps or wetlands or anything else is, is a difficult task, and we haven't really adequately accomplished that yet. But I, I think the potential is, and I think the biggest problem associated with the landfill is the potential to lower dissolved oxygen enough so that the Maloney well could be impacted with high arsenic, not arsenic coming from the landfill, not released from the landfill, arsenic that's present there right now in the aquifer skeleton, but is not coming out because there's... Change the chemistry way change downstream. Change the chemistry, you mobilize local contaminants. I think that's the issue. I guess what I would say about that is, is that we have done a model of that. We find that the impact is localized. Um, we do get, you know, relatively low dissolved oxygen concentrations at the Maloney Wells, also because of the, the clay cap effect. But we don't see the, the BOD that comes out of the um, landfill, you know, s particularly. Uh, I, I guess the I guess one way that we could look at it is maybe looking at COD instead of BOD, chemical oxygen demand, which would include some of these other chemicals as well. But I don't recall that the COD is, you know, so much higher than the BOD that I would expect our results to be much different. So I, I think this is a place where we seem to be arriving at different results, although. I mean, we, we've, we have actually modeled it, so. I, yeah. Well, let me just say that I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that BOD is a good analog for this, or COD, that you have to analyze, you have to model directly dissolved oxygen. And, and the trouble with those, the, the transport models associated with mod flow is that they don't really do that. You can put a component in and it will decay and mm -hmm. use up oxygen, but you can't model the system without that component. And if you can't model that system without that component, you can't see what the effect in the natural system is. Uh, so you first have to model it without the landfill there, and you have to be able to calibrate it to the Maloney well. And then you, you add the uh, landfill and see what the effect is. I, I guess, uh, in my mind, the, the challenge for me is trying to weigh the, the different issues. How to weight them? How to how to uh, where to put the priority? Um, and my questions are just sort of nibbling around the edges of that. Is apparently until sometime in the not too distant past, it was anticipated that there wasn't even a connection between those two broad channels of the aquifer. That's correct. Well, that's certainly my opinion. Even today, would it be fair to say that the bulk of the flow toward the Maloney Well is from that? stream running from northeast to southwest? I don't, you know, that's an interesting question. And I think this is where the models can really help us because the models, I think, and I think the models are forcing us to cause water to go through that gap. Um, and one of the tests, I think there's a test we could run. I think we could, uh, what I want to do is I want to take my canoe out to the Manhattan River. I'm going to put a bunch of thermocouples, drag them through the water, and I'm going to with my GPS on the thing, and I'm paddle down the river, and I'm going to find those cold spots where the where the springs are. And if I find a lot of springs, then that's telling me there's a lot of upwelling going on there, and maybe we can make some estimates of that and say, well, that water's not going through the gap to the Maloney Well. That's going to the Manhand River. So I think there are some things that could be done. I mean, you could do discharge studies. You could look carefully. If you can measure discharge accurately enough, you could see if the discharge is increasing during base flow as you go down the, the, the Manhattan River. There are ways to take that, to, to measure that, because if it's not going through the gap, it's got to go into the river. It's got to go into the Manhattan. And so you ought to be able to see it. Our, our model shows that, you know, and, and the way you can tell is looking at those particle tracks. Our model shows that most of the water comes through that gap. So I'd say just ballparking it looks like kind of roughly two-thirds. Okay. Just by the number of particle tracks. Now, I, I assume the unlined landfill is a source of many of the problems, certainly in the area of the landfill. 
Um, what's the rate of, in general, how quickly does the toxicity attenuate over time? It, it, for example, if you look at the 30-year time span uh, that's that where we're re required to make specific concrete funded plans for maintaining a closed landfill, is does it drop enough in 30 years that it's you, you can probably help me with this, but, uh, but I, I, my, I think, thir you know, 30 years didn't come out of thin air. 30 years represents the major a half life, or well, no, but I think it's 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 kind of when most of the biodegradation has occurred, when most of the settlement will have occurred. You know, one of the things you worry about is as these wastes degrade, then they consolidate, and you you get settlement, and your cap can shift, and so forth. So that 30 year period reflects you know, the period of greatest potential impact from those processes. And I think most of the biodegradation is done in 30 years, isn't it? And I, th I think the other thing <coughs> that's important to, to uh, consider is that the 30-year post-closure period is something that DEP has established in their regulations with a further caveat that as you progress uh, within the post-closure time period, you continue to evaluate uh, so they may uh, those extended. results. And it may be shortened or extended based on uh, what the results are showing. It's, it's, it's a starting point, not necessarily a finish point. Okay. Um, so if we find 30 years from now that, <coughs> that uh, those assumptions are incorrect, it, it, it may allow the, the monitoring to decrease in frequency if, if things are, are showing better or, or it may require a longer, longer duration of, uh, mm -hmm. of monitoring and maintenance. Thanks. Comparing, again, I, I have to admit, I'm sort of nibbling around here. I, it's not these questions don't follow in a nice, neat sequence. A lined landfill, especially, uh, you know, a modern one, is going to have dribble leakage, at least, I would imagine. Is it 5% of an unlined or 1% or? Oh. I, th I think the, the <laughs> results The results that were being calculated were uh, generally on the range of less than 1%. Okay. Um, and, and just a point of curiosity, it's my understanding the Maloney well is not an active well, right? What do you mean by active? This it, is not it, something that the town is using and... There, it's not being pumped at this time. And but it is an active well in terms of its, its, it can be pumped at any time. We have, for example, in the city of Northampton, we have some, some old watershed areas, which we use part of, partly use for a beach these days, part of that uh, watershed. I don't think we have any intention of ever going back to them. It's well, I think one of the things you've got to keep in mind is that uh, demand for water is going to increase. It's not going to decrease. It's not going to stay the same. It's going to increase. You know, we can look to what's happened in the eastern part of Massachusetts, where we used to think there was just infinite water supplies. But now we're finding that the aquifers are drying up. We're finding out that uh, the Ipswich River, I, used to, I grew up on the Ipswich River, fishing in the Ipswich River. Now it dries up. It dries up because we're pulling too much water out. That never happened in the past. We can expect, and I think, I think it's well predicted, that the demand for water is going to increase. So these wells that are standby wells today are certainly considered sources for the future. And even more. Southampton's going to be looking for more water. Um, you know, th there was a recent prediction that southeastern New, New Hampshire is going to run out of water um, in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. They're going to be looking for water. I know there's a plan. I'm doing an aquifer study in, in the Ospi area, which is about 50 miles away. And there's a, there's a plan on the table to pump, to pipe water to the southeastern New Hampshire. We've got to look at the future is going to be a greater need for water. Not less, not the same as today. There's going to be need for more water. And so we should be planning for more water, not less. It certainly seems reasonable. Um, all right, thank you very much. I, I, it's, I've, it's been really helpful. Okay, do we have any others who would like to pose questions? If not, I'd like to take an opportunity to ask a few of my own. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll be brief, and in fact, um, most of my questions have already been answered. I just wanted to follow up for a moment, if I could, on Terry's uh, question about 
the uh, the lifespan of a landfill and uh, how over how long a time frame it produces leachate, uh, contaminated leachate, or could produce contaminated leachate. And and I understand that uh, there is some sort of a uh, maybe a characteristic half-life uh, that is considerably shorter than the half-life of, uh, uh, for example, radioactive waste, which is what sometimes people think about when they talk about maintaining an entombment forever. Um, so this is a this is a different situation, but nevertheless, it's an issue that is important to address. So, my question, I guess, is, uh, to to Dr. Shanahan and, and Dr. Newton, if you want to follow up, uh, is um, is there any utility in, in after talking a little bit about what goes on in Europe? Is there any utility to trying to speed that uh, that process up a little bit? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. It's not one that comes up too often here because the regulatory scheme is so different and it's not very much encouraged. Um, it, um, it increases the operational requirements. It increases, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a more difficult operation in general, I would say. It's probably more expensive. You've got pumping and other energy costs than that you have to uh, account for. Um, um, I, I, I guess I'd almost characterize it as somewhat of a matter of preference, really. Um, but you know, you, you, this is an aside, but you mentioned um, radioactive waste. And, and one thing that did occur to me as you mentioned that is I actually worked on the siting studies for a low-level radioactive waste facility in um, Illinois. At, at one time, you may be aware, the, the states were all charged with taking care of their low-level radioactive waste while the feds took care of the real high-level stuff that's going to um, the whip site in Yucca Mountain maybe someday. Um, they actually use pretty much the same technology. They use these liners. They use the plastic liners and so forth. The one thing that they did do a little bit differently is they encased it in concrete within that because they're worried very much about physical intrusion as well. But as far as, you know, the, the control of water, they basically use the same technology as we're talking about here. So. But interestingly enough, the Canadians uh, in their radioactive waste um, I guess Chalk River, they actually put it in water and they run the river through it um, using the philosophy of the solution to pollution is dilution. Yeah. Okay. If I could just ask one more question and then, then I think we're done. Um, this, this returns to the whole question of, of BOD and dissolved oxygen. And uh, first, um, as I understand it, uh, Dr. Shanahan, you mentioned that we have uh, typical recharge rates of around 19 inches a year, that w w what we expect um, in this, this part of the country. Um, and there was some estimate at some point of a leakage rate uh, from a lined landfill, and uh, I think it was on the order of uh, 300 gallons per acre, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm thinking of another part of uh, another uh, scenario. Um, but uh, yeah, if you could verify that. If you, if you presume um, that the landfill, and, and this is just a back of the envelope calculation, uh, is leaking at about 300 gallons an acre, and we'll see if that's a good assumption or not, uh, that amounts to about, I calculated about 0 0.01 inches per year of uh, recharge, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, which is about one two thousandth of the natural rate. So if a landfill, and you know, just by my very simple calculation, and I know it's, it's, uh, it is uh, especially simple, but if a landfill is going to produce a greater amount of BOD or maybe chemical oxygen demand is a, is a better me measure because you've got F essentially forever to degrade. And, um, and so if you've got um, a, long, a long time, uh, um, if, if it's going to contaminate the groundwater with an excessive amount of COD, uh, it would have to have a concentration of COD that's on the order of 2,000 times as high as natural infiltration water COD uh, because you've got one two thousandth as much. Coming. So um, what I'm trying to get at is a comparison of the probability of the landfill um, that's leaking 
uh, would contaminate uh, groundwater um, with high levels of BOD or COD versus a, a natural un, um, undisturbed area. Um, and so it seems to me then, if we're talking about a, a typical value for a, a COD of um, water that's infiltrating in the upper horizons, soil, um, maybe a number of about 2.5 milligrams per liter is not unreasonable. Um, by my calculation, that means that you, to match that, just to match the natural amount that's going in, you'd have to have a leachate with 5,000 milligrams per liter BOD or COD, uh, which is, in fact, about, I think, very close to the, the value you used in, in the model. Um, so with this real simple calculation, it, it seems to me that uh, on, you know, unless I'm doing something that's completely uh, wrong um, and unreasonable, that uh, the landfill should not be substantially different in its impact on COD in the subsurface than an undisturbed uh, tract of land of the same size if you assume that it leaks at 300 gallons per acre. Well, I think the you know it, it, it's an interesting analysis, and um, I'm not too sure about the 2.5 milligrams per liter. It doesn't seem that unreasonable when I do consider what is known about um, you know the geochemistry underneath landfills. There, there certainly is a you know a, a DO impact, and it's typically anaerobic beneath the landfill, and it's not in other areas. So. Um, I think we have to look at it some more. <laughs> Dr. Newton, do you want to respond at all? I, I don't think I, I can. I'd have to go through and do some more calculations. I'm not okay. prepared to do those okay. back of the envelope calculations at this point in time. Okay, well, well thank you very much. And uh, I think we're at the end, so I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All in favor? I think we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs>